U.S., who was uh, also part of the Smithsonian Group, is now at CERN, and uh, will be a faculty at Durham this year. And then my students, Madalena Lemos, Penelope, and Bob Pellarts. Um, so there's been an explosion of results about uh, theories which are both conformal and supersymmetric uh, in the last several years, especially in dimension we have two. We have known about two dimensional superconformative theories for a longer time, and those are also interesting, but uh, uh, the, the recent progress has been on higher dimensional theories. And um, a lot of these models were uh, originally discovered uh, in the context of string theory, uh, but as often is, has been the case in recent years, you discover something in string theory, but then you realize that it's, you, can, you can really phrase the problem, and, 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 and in many cases, uh, the answer uh, in, in field theoretical terms, but string theory still gives a nice uh, intuition, or perhaps a dramatic way to think about it. And one of the surprises, um, which I think I tried to emphasize yesterday as, as a conceptual uh, shift of viewpoint, is that uh, the vast majority of these models do not have a Lagrangian description. And um, a lot of work has been done and is being done. Um, you can cite these theories by a variety of techniques. Uh, first and foremost, there is uh, this item, effective actions on the moduli space. This is the subject of cyber witten theory. You give a VEV to some of the operators of the theory, and uh, you study what happens uh, on, uh, on the theory, which is now has broken conformal invariance. And at low energies, you find some uh, simple description in terms of an abelian theory, and a nice story, uh, quite old by now. Uh, for some very special classes uh, of theories, uh, you can use the tools of integrability. And for what I emphasize is really a small subset of theories, if they do have a Lagrangian description, it is often the case that for certain particular uh, observables, the infinite dimensional path integral uh, that you have to do um, localizes, that's a technical word, it means that it becomes a finite dimensional integral, which you can simply do. And so the, my view is that this is all beautiful and nice, but uh, it's a bit of a hodgepodge of, of, of techniques, and we need a more systematic way to think about the problem. And, and as uh, I emphasized yesterday we uh, want to use a systematic universal way to think about theories, which is the conformal Can I ask a question? Yes. How can you write down a model without having a You don't write down. You don't write you don't write it down. You know it exists by a variety of indirect hints and, and you know something about it indirectly. So yes. The question is what are this uh, indirect well, for example, you, we, we know that there is this overarching framework with a string theory, which we think is, is, is correct, although we can't quite formulate it to the satisfaction of mathematician. And we know that they have, for example, some extended objects, uh, various brains, and on very general, uh, uh, you know, from very, from very general arguments, we know that the, the low energy fluctuation should be described by, by some field theory. We call, I call it a field theory, though. I don't have an explicit set of fields I can write down, but I know that I should have local uh, correlation functions and the whole uh, story of, uh, of the observables of a field theory without actually knowing the fields. So basically, the philosophy is the same as for these two, two, when you have phase transition, you know that you have right. uh, Yes, for example, yeah, a, 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 another uh, simpler uh, answer would be indeed we're accustomed in two dimensions uh, for, for most of the minimal models that we don't have uh, a direct Lagrangian description of, of the system, but we have a more abstract definition in terms of what you said. It's, it's the field theory that describes a certain uh, 
long wavelength limit of phase transition, but uh, at least in those cases, uh, we can do a little bit better than this, and we can give a, for example, landau ginsburg description of the body, where we have a UV description, and then we throw to the infrared. That is not the case for the vast majority of the model in this family. We do not have such a, the luxury of having a UV description and then flow. So is that M theory, Lagrangian? Excuse me? M theory, is it Lagrangian? Oh, I don't know. It's not a conformal theory, but so in that sense, it doesn't fall into the limited scope. And, and, uh, but um, I would be surprised if it was. Do you think probably not? Probably not. Okay, so let me quickly review the basic philosophy. We want to think of the theory abstract in terms of a set of local operators and its correlation functions. Um, and the operator form this uh, algebra. So operators at different space-time points can be multiplied. <coughs> it's an infinite sum which converges. So if I insert this uh, equation into a correlation function, the sum will be absolutely convergent with radius of convergence given by the distance to the closest uh, third operator. And I want to add a little disclaimer here. Uh, there's more to the theory than just local operators. <coughs> we are, for example, used to the fact that in a, in a gauge theory, there are other interesting no local observables, such as Wilson loops. And so those are, 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 are ignored in this, in, this, uh, in this description of the theory. We will think about them later. For now, let me focus on, on local operators. And I'm also ignoring the fact that you will obtain uh, interesting additional constraints by placing the theory in a non-trivial geometry. Everything I'm doing here is in flat Euclidean space. And uh, those of you who, are, um, who have studied two-dimensional conformal theory, we remember that there, um, the operator algebra is only one piece of the story. Uh, another uh, equally important piece of the story is that you have constraints from modular invariants, from the fact that by putting the theory on the non-trivial Riemann surface, uh, the conformal data are further constrained. The higher dimension analog of, of, of modular invariants is not understood. Uh, and if you think about it for one minute, it's clear why, because in two dimension, uh, you have this uh, nice coincidence that uh, that slicing up the, the toros in two different ways uh, give you two description both in terms of local operators. In higher dimensions, if you slice, if you can you can think of various geometries, but you will not be able to equate the description in terms of local operators on one side with the description again in terms of local operators. You will, you will relate local with non local. So, so the local operators come with labels, so they form a representation of the conformal group. And the representation of the conformal group will be labeled by the conformal dimension delta, by the Lorentz uh, quantum number L, and possibly if you have some additional uh, global symmetry commuting with a conformal group, some further flavor quantum number. And so the theory is completely specified if you tell me the quantum numbers of the local operators and their three-point couplings. And the reason is that I can successfully apply the Quirk process function till I get to a single operator. And the single operator will have zero vacuum expectation value by conformal invariance, unless it's the identity, which I normalize to have. This one point function equal to one. Sorry, this might be a technical question, but are you assuming that there is no degeneracy, that there are never two operators with the same set of... No, I'm not assuming that. Okay. Although, I'm not aware of any uh, example. So, okay. the only example I know where I have a degeneracy is because I have neglected... So, okay. if there is a degeneracy, presumably it's because some additional similar have not accounted for. Okay. Uh, uh, so, let me ask yeah. you another question. It seems that for string theory, you do not have any hope for any OP. Uh, in in space-time, you mean? In space, yeah. Yes. Space well, I mean, space I it's a totally different theory because I don't have conformal invariants there. Yeah, but uh, yes. really. Okay, but let's see if you have uh, 
interface borders uh, emit into form, the form of CA with ADS. What happens uh, with strings on ADS? What happens um, with OP? In oh, case in, that case, in that case, uh, uh, in that case, I, I do have an OP because I, I think of the theory in terms of the boundary observables. So the boundary theory in that case of the this five The boundary five. theory is uh, yeah, the but the bulk theory is an illusion. And the bulk theory, the, 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 bulk, theory, the bulk theory is is uh, is uh, you know is, is um, sure there is some local dynamics in the bulk, but the observables are the boundary correlators. So the boundary correlators are the analog of the S matrix for the ADS five and S five theory. So I want I want to phrase. The discussion purely in terms of the observables, which in that case would be the correlation function of the local boundary operators. Um, okay, so so this data, which is the, the dimension, spins, and, and uh, uh, three-point couplings, are constrained by first and foremost the idea that uh, the I should be able to do your in different orders and get the same answer. This, is this famous crossing relation, and so the long a held hope of the conformal booster is that this being an over constrained system of equations should be enough to completely solve the theory. Of course, you have to give me something as a starting point, such as what is the global symmetry and perhaps what, what are the relevant operators. Some, some minimum physical input will be enough to completely corner the theory. And in two dimensions, this has indeed been done with enormous success. And as I quickly reviewed yesterday, since 2008, we have a way to turn these uh, relations into inequalities where we carve out in the space of data some, some regions which recently uh, have become islands, so we can really corner interesting theories and get uh, numerically some very interesting results. That will not be the main focus of my talk, because I will instead focus on um, on more analytic results. Uh, the, in the big scheme of things, what we would like to do uh, in studying super field theories by these methods uh, are, are I mean, clearly there are two broad kind of questions. Uh, I mean, perhaps the most ambitious one. We have a lot of symmetry. Can we achieve a complete classification? Can we just enumerate the list of all possible superconformative theories in various dimensions? Now, if I have maximal supersymmetry, which should be n equal to 4 in 4 dimensions, or 2, 0 in 6 dimensions, or n equals 8 in 3 dimensions, then, again, from largely from string theory intuition, uh, we can compile a list of theories that we know should exist, and very likely it's a complete list. Uh, because if there were another n equal to four theory in four dimensions, we would have somehow found it. Uh, but of course, that's not a proof of anything. And so, um, so one thing that the booster could do for you is to actually really give you a classification, a complete classification of, of these theories and prove that this uh, conjectural list is indeed complete. Now, if you reduce the number of supersymmetry, of course, life becomes a lot more interesting, a lot, a lot, also harder. And uh, a lot of our recent work has been in, uh, for theories in four dimensions with half maximum supersymmetry, n equal to two. Uh, if you further go down to n equal to one, Basically, there's no hope of, of even the, the beginning of a scheme, and there's a huge zoo of theories. And uh, one of my famous, one of my favorite um, possible applications of this kind of thinking uh, has to do with uh, killing the string theory landscape. So you have heard perhaps that there is this conjectural enormous amount of vacuum of string theory. Uh, and then once you have this enormous amount of vacuum, you are supposed to do anthropic selection to choose the correct one. Um, and many of these constructions in string theory start uh, with a four-dimensional vacuum that has negative cosmological spots, ADS4. And then from there, you do various uplifts uh, to get positive cosmological constant. And, uh, and so uh, if you believe the arguments given by people who do flux compatification in string theory, there's a humongous 
landscape of, of in fact, supersymmetric uh, vacua uh, with ADS4 symmetry, which should be dual to, by ADS3 three dimensional um, superconformal field theories. And so, if we could somehow uh, rule them out, we would have ruled out the string theory landscape. Uh, because such theories would, be, would have to be very peculiar, have to be rather uh, large hierarchies. Now, of course, I'm not saying that we will succeed, uh, but I think it's worth, it's worth trying. Because if you, if you succeed, you have done something awesome. And if you fail, presumably you will fail in some interesting way. Yes. In, in what sense would you rule them out? Just because they're not super conformal? No, no. So, so I, I sketched this uh, uh, very quickly, and I talked a little bit more uh, about it yesterday. Is this equation? This equation is very constraining, and and um, that's right. So you prove you prove that you prove that that uh, the solution of this question are, are not as many as, as what you uh, be require for this idea of the superior landscape. But the uplifting moduli, those, that's sort of more like boundary conditions, whereas these are operator equations, right? These are the operator equations. Are you saying that these crossing symmetries also uh, bring in information about the moduli vacuum expectation values in your head? Uh, okay, so so in this um, scenario that I was I was quickly uh, reviewing of this uh, string theory landscape, the moduli have, are supposed to have all been fixed. So these theories are, are isolated uh, vacuum, uh, which by the SFT are dual to isolated conformal field theories. That's that's actually really just a start. Actually, this is the part of the story that nobody really questions. Okay, so I'm 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 doing something which. Uh, it's, it's probably doomed to fail because uh, nobody really questioned the existence of this large number of ADS vacuum, though, though the constructions are very indirect. From there, then there are a variety of more questionable uh, techniques to, to go from negative cosmological to positive cosmological, to positive cosmological to positive. But I want to kill the baby in the crib by saying mm -hmm. even the ADS vacuum should not exist. <laughs> but of course. I'm just saying. I mean, it's it's one one possible application of this set of ideas, which uh, you could try to push and see how far you get. What would be the state of the, I mean, that you like the new limited and possible models of negative cosmological constant that you need? No, the, you see the the. Okay, so I, I see that my talk is getting I mean, late, I, but it's okay. I I I, I, I will see. I will see. We will we'll get where we get. Uh, actually, uh, perhaps I should have said this at the beginning. It, let's have an open discussion, and I, uh, even if I get only to one third of what I want to say, it's fine. So, um, so the, these constructions of uh, uh, the, um, in string theory, they, they are quite complicated. You have different types of fluxes and, and whatnot uh, that are supposed to achieve this uh, moduli stabilization. And the resulting models have uh, this feature that the um, cosmological constant, the, the scale set by the cosmological constant, um, there's a, let me say this way, there's a huge hierarchy between, between the scale set by the cosmological so constant and the Kaluza Klein scale. Yeah. This is something we have not seen in any field theory that we can explicitly construct which are super symmetry. All the examples that we have are such that the scales set by the cosmological constant, the Kaluza kind of case, are comparable. Uh, canonical example is ADS5 times S5, where, where, where the, the, the radius of the sphere is the same as the radius of ADS, so the Kaluza Klein modes of the sphere. Mm -hmm. And so you don't, just have M, you don't just have nearly empty ADS. The ADS is filled with this huge so chunk of Kaluza Klein light modes. And blah, blah, blah. Lots of light states. In all controllable examples that we can study, that's the situation. Then there is this other set of arguments from flux multiplication that say, no, actually, there is a huge list that nobody has ever seen of, of, uh, of theories which have very different properties. And 
I mean, there's no contradiction, but there's some certain some tension between the fact that we have nobody, nobody has constructed this series and they're supposed yeah, to from exist. First principles, there is also all these KKLT type arguments about blah, exactly. blah, blah. And so I'm, I'm, I'm suggesting, and, and okay. I haven't even beginning to do it, but I'm suggesting that perhaps the booster could constrain theories that have such large hierarchy and perhaps rule them out. Now, uh, on the other hand, a, a, more, a more concrete thing you can do is you have your favorite model, n equal 4 square meals, and to come as your theory, can we um, use these methods to actually solve the models, or perhaps numerically if we must. And in particular, uh, for non-Lagrangian theory, such as 2 comma zero theory, this is really the only game in town. Okay, so now the moment you start doing this in practice, um, it's not so clear that supersymmetry is such a big boost. Uh, and the reason is that, uh, again, it's this, uh, sorry, it's this um, set of equations. This is really an infinite set of equations for infinitely many uh, unknowns. What supersymmetry will do for you will uh, give you some relations between the equations and some relation between the unknowns. But the relation is a finite number. Because the, the, the symmetry, the, the, conf the representation of the conformal group is infinite dimensional, and the super conformal representation will decompose into a finite number of conformal representations. So, what super zero does for you is reduce this infinite mass by finite amounts. And so, it is a priori not clear that uh, it is such a great boost. And so, we want to, to, uh, to really ask. Uh, a side question, that, that, that was our entry into this business, which turned out to be fruitful. <coughs> and, and the idea of, is a familiar one for those of you who have studied supersymmetry before. Supersymmetry is great because special subsectors of, of supersymmetric theories are solvable. And so let's ask this very natural question then. Uh, do the boost of equations for superconformal theories have a solvable truncation. Perhaps the whole thing is still a mess, but I can zoom in a subsector where the parallel supersymmetry will give me exact results. And indeed, that's the case. And we need um, specific symmetry. So I cannot quite do this for what perhaps would be the most interesting case, which is four dimensional with uh, n equal one supersymmetry. But I can do it in four dimensions if I have at least n equals to two. n equals to four is also a possibility. And I can also do this in the most, at least, uh, mathematically interesting case, which is the six dimensional to zero case. So what I will outline today is uh, the fact that these theories, any of these theories, all, all you see, any theory that has this amount of supersymmetry, uh, will admit a subset of its operator algebra, which will be isomorphic to what I'm calling a two-dimensional chiral algebra. Two-dimensional chiral algebra is what mathematicians call a vertex operator algebra, which is the left-moving part, the chiral half, of a two-dimensional conformal field theory. And there's also some work in progress uh, of another nice story. We can do the same thing in three dimension and get in some more weaker results, but today I will focus on this. And so, for these theories, then, the booster program really splits into two parts. First of all, we can, we can focus on this uh, protected subcenter of the admits a, a exact solution. We, we call this the mini booster. The booster equation for uh, op uh, protected operators split into two sets. One that only captures intermediate protected operators in this in this expansion with the with the internal channels that I had earlier, and they are captured by the chiral algebra. And then the rest of the equation we put the maxi booster. This number one we can solve for given some minimal physical input. Number two, we have to resort to numerics. But nevertheless, the information that you get in step one is an infinite amount of information about the protective pattern, about the, the couplings, that becomes an essential input for the numerical program. So 
these are really two separate talks, and today I will mostly focus on number one, and if time permits, which I think will be unlikely, perhaps flesh some results about the numerical stuff. Okay, so that concludes my introduction. And um, the rest of the talk will be rather technical. I apologize, but there's really no way around it. Uh, but before um, I plan to technicalities, just to make sure that uh, some of you get at least something out of it. If you have, it, I mean, of course, many of you have, are experts, but those of you who are not experts, let me give you a lightning review of supersymmetry and of superconformativity in one slide. So, what is conformal symmetry? Well, you have um, the momentum generators, mu uh, goes from round over the number of space and dimensions, is the translation generator, the momentum. M is Lorentz transformations. B is the dilation generator, x going to lambda x. And then the peculiarity of conformal symmetry as opposed to just scale invariance is that you have these additional special conformal transformations, k. So what is supersymmetry? Well, supersymmetry is the square root of the Poincaré algebra. So you have both fermionic generators, q and q tilde, that commute to p. Uh, sometimes we are greedy, and one copy of uh, super generators are not enough for our ambition. So we want to take n of them. So this curly n is what I was referring to earlier when I was counting n to 1, equal to 2, etc. It's the number of copies of supersymmetry algebra. And so there is an index A, uh, so you, you see that the Q and Q tilde transform. If this is the fundamental representation, this is the anti fundamental, this is the uh, anti fundamental representation. And you know, each of them is a copy of the supersymmetry algebra, the old square P. And you see, you can rotate the supercharges by uh, a continuous UN. Rotation, which is called the art symmetry, because some generators are AB, but the art symmetry uh, transformation are not part of the supersymmetry algebra. You see, they're, they're just a mathematical terms, an automorphism of the algebra, not part of the algebra. Now we want to combine conformal symmetry with supersymmetry, and much like the square root of P is, is Q, now I have this extra target K, which sort of appeared in a, in a uh, symmetric row with P, so the most natural thing of the world is that I will also have to take the square root of K. The square root of K is called S, so we have S and S tilde that commute to K, n copies of them if I want to get, do any equal to do a standard superconformal symmetry. And finally, I need to tell you the commutator of Q and S, that will be Lorentz, dilation, and R. And you see, then, then the art symmetry becomes part of the superconformal algebra. Okay, so I realize that if you have not seen this before, this is hopeless, but at least you will know some what some of the symbols that I will have in the previous slides are meant to me. Okay, so now I'm supposed to explain to you how I get this protected subsector out, and I want to. Um, remind you of something, hopefully you've seen this before, or if you haven't seen it before, you learn it now. The n equal 1 chiral ring. So this is a familiar story, um, which has been uh, used to great effect. If you have n equal 1 supersymmetry in four dimensions, your supercharges are spinners uh, of, they are sort of bi spinners, so there's an index that takes two values. And what is a chiral operator? A chiral operator is an operator which is killed by the tilde supercharge. I can further define equivalence classes of, of chiral operators which differ uh, by commutators with Q tilde. And then it's a little exercise using a supersymmetry algebra to prove <laughs> that the space-time derivative of a chiral operator is in fact Q tilde of something else, so it's exact. So it means that since I'm defining equivalence classes of things that are identified up to exact terms, 
in cohomology, if I, if, I, if I make this identification, the operator is in fact independent of the position. Or to say this in, in a more concrete way, if I have a correlation function where each operator is chiral, since I can take the derivative of, say, the first one, and then the, that means I get something which is Q tilde of something else, I can integrate this by parts, and when Q tilde, uh, Q -tilde lands on the other guys, which are all chiral, I get zero, so I've proved that the derivative with respect to x1 is zero, and so this whole thing is constant. And so this is a, indeed a topological theory, yes? Could you please define the bra and catch? <coughs> oh, this is just a correlation. So what do you think mean? of this as operators, and then there is an in, in vacuum and an out vacuum. So could you define that to use your operators? You didn't define it. Uh, well, uh, I mean, this is a very absurd discussion, right? So I have, I have um, a Hilbert space of states uh, in, in a, I have a vacuum, an in vacuum, an out vacuum. The, the discussion so far is, is completely uh, abstract, right? So in any concrete example, uh, I don't know, you do any one uh, theory in C plus one dimension, then you have time that defines a vacuum at time called minus infinity, an out vacuum at time called plus infinity, and these are standard time order correlation functions of, of Eisenberg operators in your theory. Yeah, but uh, it needs a definition vacuum to what operator or respect to what, right? Um, Maybe you talk about this afterwards? Excuse me? Maybe you talk about this point afterwards and get going? Um, yeah. I'm not doing anything. I'm not doing anything. Um, fancy. I'm, I'm willing. We're willing to to postpone this question after the uh, talk. It is just. But, but this is a very crucial to me, at least, to understand. Um, I don't think it should be right. So, um, in, in it's a, okay. Please go in on. A, in a um, Should we build a vacuum for the fermion operators? Of course. I mean, the vacuum will have to the vacuum will have to be the supersymmetric vacuum that uh, that is annihilated by the. I mean, let's let's say axiomatic, right? I have I have a quantum field theory with a unique truncated super uh, I just finished that sentence. Super. Um, I don't know. You are you are probably uh, used to the Whiteman axioms. Axiomatic as a unique quantum invariant vacuum. That's my point. <laughs> now, in in uh, if I have um, super conformal invariants, this story is not useful. The reason it is not useful is because I told you that the R charge is part of the algebra, and a chiral operator is such that the uh, conformal dimension is proportional to the art symmetry, and so the performance dimension is positive, and so the art symmetry is positive for all chiral operators. And so given that the art symmetry is a conserved quantum number, this correlation function is simply zero because uh, from selection, you want selection rules. All the operators are positive R, and in order for this to be non-zero, you have to, the R charge to sum to zero, which it doesn't. So this constant is in fact zero. And so let's now do something more clever. And the more clever thing that we can do requires to upgrade the number of supercharges from 1 to 2. So uh, let me first describe this rather schematically, and then I will give uh, some more details later. So the main claim is the following. In any n equal to 2 four-dimensional superconformal field theory, I can fix a plane in R4, which I parameterize as always with uh, complex coordinates in the bar. And I can identify a subsector of operators which uh, live on the plane. And when I compute this correlation function with respect to the unique superconformal invariant vacuum, a priori they are functions of both Z and Z bar, but in fact they are only functions of Z, they are meromorphic. So here these are local operators, you're just fixing all the other coordinates, is that what you I am a local operator, which by fiat I decide to 
place on this imaginary plane. This plane, uh, there's nothing physical happening on this plane. It's not a defect or anything. There are no specific boundary conditions of any kind. I just decide to study a correlation function where the operator are sitting on that plane. What is the, the, the reason that this is happening? Well, because by definition, this subset of operators has been identified uh, as operators which are uh, annihilated by a certain nilpotent operator, a certain supercharge. And what is different with respect to what I had in the previous slide now, this operator is a linear combination of a standard Q and a conformal uh, supercharge S. And much like in the previous slide, where it turns out that the full space-time dependence was exact, something weaker will be true here, that the z-bar dependence would be exact. And so that in cohomology, this operator will in fact be metamorphic. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, this is similar, but much richer, because before I just had a constant, here now I had a metamorphic function, and the story would be more interesting. Do you understand correctly that you can modify this definition of uh, uh, the so sum uh, Q, uh, Q plus S adding some uh, uh, factors? Here? Okay. Yes. You could, okay. but, that, uh, but you could undo that by, by a, a unitary transformation. Yes, so in the, end, in the end, so long as that factor is non-zero, you obtain something which should be tri rather, rather trivially equivalent. So it would be... Uh, some, some simple change of some simple change of variables. It not it will not modify the story significantly. Now, um, so now let me describe what these operators are. And uh, the, here there is interesting uh, novelty with respect to the previous case, and the novelty has to do with the fact. Uh, <coughs> Perhaps um, it was in the previous slide, but let me repeat it. The commutator of the momentum which generates uh, the translations and the S charge is non zero. In fact, it's a Q charge, it's a Q charge. And so that means that if I identify a state which is in the cohomology at a certain point, the very same state cannot be in the cohomology at a different point because the operation of translation does not commute with the with the important operator. And so I'm going to describe the process of computing the cohomology into two steps. First, I will compute the cohomology at a specific point, which I will take to be the origin. And then I will describe how to how, what is the correct way to translate the operator away from the origin. Yeah, this is probably it's related to this my question because this, uh, the transformation probably is precisely transformation. Uh, 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 I don't think it's related, but uh, yeah, let's let's talk about it later. So, so the at the origin, the story is very similar to the previous one. You, need, you, you have a certain relation between the art symmetry quantum number that I mentioned, which is your necessary condition for the operator to be in the cohomology. But with an interesting twist, that now it's not just the conformal dimension of P, but the conformal dimension minus the spin. So now, I have, unlike the chiral case, I can now have or, operator with arbitrarily high spin, in particular with arbitrarily high uh, meromorphic derivatives, and that's necessary for me to get a non-trivial dependence on Z. Uh, so this spin here is the spin on the plane, which is the sum of the Lorentz spin. And this R here is the Cartan generator of the non-abelian piece of the art symmetry. Remember, I have n equal to 2, so I have U2 art symmetry. This U2 is SU2 times U1, and the SU2 is the part that it focuses on. Now, this part will be uh, presumably a uh, mysterious view, but in fact, we are, um, these operators are really dear to our heart because uh, it, it, they, they are the, they've been one of the main things I've studied in my life in the last several years. Uh, they, comp they are uh, something that is, 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 is beautiful mathematical physics to them. 
there is a certain limit of the superconformal index which just counts them and there is a connection with to the formula means, etc. There's a whole story that I don't have time to review now. But uh, we know exactly what kind of operators these are. And from if you are an equal one person, they will look exotic to you because these operators obey a exotic short term condition. They are killed by a single real Q and a single real Q tilde. And this is not something you could ever do in n equals to 1, because in n equals to 1, Q and tilde commute the momentum. And you know, if so if something is killed by Q and given by Q tilde, it's also killed by the momentum, which means it must be the N entity. With, in n equal to 2, I can choose one Q which commutes with a Q tilde, because I, I, I choose the indices, the R indices to be such that they commute, and then I get a non-trivial condition. Uh, so uh, you couldn't, if you had n equals 1 super conformal, yeah. you couldn't try to do this with q and s instead of q and q tilde? Do something uh, like this? You're welcome to try. I don't think you could. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, I just wonder if there was some simple reason that you could see that it wouldn't work, or is it more that... Um, yeah, I think the simple reason will perhaps become, come back, uh, become more clear in a moment. And it's the fact that in order for this construction to uh, be non-trivial, I really need uh, a non-abelian art symmetry. Otherwise, OK, I, I sorry, already gave you an, a, an explanation. In the n equal 1 case, the natural relative operator have all the same sign of the art symmetry. And the fact that the art symmetry is just a charge gets in my way. Right, so here, here I have, I have a whole, uh, I, have, I will have multiples of operators, so, and so I can get non-trivial correlation function from the fact that I, one piece will, will contain a top component, one piece will contain a bottom component, and I get something else. Okay, so, so this is the most, perhaps one of the most technical slide of my, of my talk, and uh, um, don't be too scared, but you go through this rather um, interesting exercise of, of classifying the possible super multiples using super conformal representation theory. And these multiples have funny names, which were given uh, to them by Bonn and Osborne. And you identify which of the multiples can contain some of these uh, operators that are in my homology. And it's a whole nice story. Uh, I want to highlight the physics of it. Perhaps the most familiar operators are, are the ones that appear in the first slide. So these are operators that parameterize the Higgs branch of the theory. So a theory that has n equal to supersymmetry has two, the, the modular space of Bakia will, uh, will, will have a list to these connected pieces. One is the Higgs branch, and the other is the Coulomb branch. On the Higgs branch, the SU2 art symmetry is broken, but the U1 symmetry is preserved. On the Coulomb branch, it's the other way around. The U1 symmetry is broken, and the SU2 symmetry is preserved. And so, um, if you have, if you have uh, been exposed to any supersymmetry a little bit, you will know that there are two kinds of multiplets uh, that you use in the Lagrangian description, hypermultiples and vector multiplets. And hypermultiples contain complex killers, and the complex scale of the hypermultiple parameterize the Higgs branch. So these operators are operators which are, which are made out of, in a Lagrangian theory, they will be made out of the complex scale of the hypermultiples. Uh, but the story is a lot more general, and there are these other more intricate operators, in particular, an operator that contain a number of derivatives. And some of the operators that will make uh, appearance later on are um, the uh, stress sensor multiple operators. Every conformal theory has, which is local, the stress sensor. By any one to super symmetry, the stress sensor belongs to a certain multiple which ought to contain the art symmetry currents, the nether current of the art symmetry, and the, a certain component of the SU2 art symmetry current is uh, in this list. And it's also important to emphasize what is not in this list. Operators which are made out of this complex scalar of the vector multiples, which are the, the main uh, object that appears under Witten theory, are not 
in the list. Okay, so let me finish the story now. It turns out that my funny supercharge commutes with the, with the uh, conformal, uh, with translations, and in fact with the whole SL2 symmetry acting on Z, but it does not commute with the SL2 symmetry acting on Z bar. And so in order to define the operator away from the origin, what I'm going to do, I modify what it means to translate the Z-bar coordinate. And I not, not only I translate the Z-bar coordinate, but I simultaneously rotate in SU2 space. So I redefine my right-moving generators, which are the bar generators by putting a hat on them. And the way I redefine them is by adding a piece of SU2R. And if I do that, this New, the new notion of SL2 hat becomes exact, and in practice that means, again, that to translate the operator away from the origin, I simultaneously change the coordinate dependence and I rotate in SU2R symmetry space. So the operator belongs to some multiplets of SU2R, and at the origin is, is the highest component, and away from the origin will be a linear combination of higher and lower components. And I will see, we will see an example in a moment. And then, um, then the condition I had earlier, simply the condition that the right moving dimension with this new modified active uh, definition is zero. And so then um, it's not then hard to see that given that the bar dependence is exact, the operator is meromorphic, and, and I have a purely meromorphic operator for this function where these uh, powers of z here are in integers. And this is, by definition, a two-dimensional parallel algebra. What is a two-dimensional parallel algebra? Well, it's an algebra where the operators depend on a single meromorphic coordinate z with a meromorphic operator for this function of this kind, and of course, the operator part of this function will converge and will be associative as always. So have you learnt the C's at this point? Sorry? I'm getting lost. Have you learnt the C's at this point? The C12K, do you know them or? No, I'm going to compute them because um, given minimal input, mm -hmm. I will now have meromorphic correlation functions. Mm -hmm. A meromorphic correlation function can be fixed very easily because they're fixed by singularities and that will compute the C for you. Okay, so um, it, uh, yes. So how does this depend on your choice of plane? You just get it depends trivially in the sense algorithm. that it depends that uh, it means that a particular choice of, of this uh, super family Q okay. chooses the plane. Oh, okay. Rotating the plane means I've, I I would choose a different Q, but of course they're all equivalent. But it's still isomorphic algebra. Absolutely so yes. Okay. Could you interpret this as a dimensional reduction to the four-dimensional series or two dimensions? I don't think so. And the reason it's not dimensional reduction is that um, there are many reasons why that, not, that is not the case. But um, the most important one is that uh, the um, um, it's more like localization. It's not dimensional reduction. If you choose special observables, they will become two dimensional. But it's not dimensional reduction. And in dimensional reduction, you get this whole Kaluza Klein tower, which would be different. Let me give an example of the formalism and, and what kind of structure we get. And then I will have to accelerate a bit. OK, you hopefully you have seen hypermultiples before. But if you don't, it doesn't matter. Think about two complex scalars, Q and Q tilde, and it turns out that Q and the complex conjugate of Q tilde form an SU2 doublet, and Q tilde and the complex conjugate of Q form another SU2 doublet. So how do I form my uh, uh, Q closed operators? Well, I follow the procedure I told you earlier. Away from, at the origin, I just pick the, the, the top components. Away from the origin, it's a linear combination of the top and of the bottom component with the Z bar. That is, in this concrete example, what it means to change the definition of translation. 
a change in fish alteration in such a way that there is a way to go away from the origin, I simultaneously translate and do <coughs> a, an S2 rotation. And then it's a simple exercise to see that these operators so defined have a meromorphic OP. And why is that? Well, let's look at this in detail. The second operator, which is at the origin, uh, the Z bar is not there. And then the only possible singularity can, ca ca can come when Q tilde is accompanied with the conjugate of Q tilde, which appears with a with a expression Z bar, and then in, in four dimensions, scale is a dimension one, and so <coughs> this gives me one over Z Z bar, and so the Z bar depends on so out. So you see that for this simple thing to, to work, it's necessary that I can keep simultaneously in the story the top and bottom component of the multiple. That gives me a trivial singularity. And so it turns out then that I have a conformal the Kyle of the conformal field theory, which with a simple OP, which gives me one over Z, this is a beta gamma system, or in fancy language, the Kyle symplectic bosons is a non unitary uh, chiral algebra with central charge, two dimensional central charge equal minus one. You can play the same game for vector multiplets. Again, you have the K genus of the vector multiple for the doublet. And that now these are fermionic operators with meromorphic OPE, which identify with a pair, a BC ghost system of weight 1, 0, which has negative central charge, minus 2. OK, so that was for free theories. So free theories, not too surprisingly, perhaps, correspond to free chiral algebra. And now we will proceed in a more abstract, bootstrappy way. And without making any assumption on the theory we want to milk as much as we can superconformal representation theory and derive general properties. The first great indication that we're doing something really non-trivial comes from the observation that by construction the theory that we have defined should have global conformal invariance on the plane, SL2. But in fact this SL2 enhances to the full Virasoro algebra. And the way that comes about is because any four dimensional superconformal field theory will have a stress tensor. A part of the stress tensor will be the SU2R symmetry current, which is in my cohomology, and it will give rise to a uh, chiral operator of dimension 2, which we identified two dimensional stress tensor. The two dimensional central charge is minus 12 times the C anomaly coefficient of the theory. The C anomaly coefficient is one of the two by anomaly coefficients in four dimensions. The other is usually called A. So this is the one which is usually a little bit neglected because A is the one which is monotonic under Archie flow and C is not. But that's the one that we have. Similarly, if the theory has a, has a global symmetry, the nether current for the global symmetry will be in the same multiple as a certain operator, which is called the moment map which is a scalar operator of dimension 2. If I play the same game, I get a chiral operator of dimension 1, which is an affine <coughs> current, with level equal minus 1 half of the four-dimensional level. Another universal thing that I learned is that the generators of the four-dimensional Higgs branch necessarily become generators of the chiral algebra. And this is something that perhaps, if I have time, I will say in a couple of minutes. The Higgs branch is, is an algebraic variety which is defined by um, a set of uh, operators obeying polynomial relations. And the polynomial relations of the Higgs branch uh, are encoded algebraically in the fact that the, uh, uh, this negative level of fine smoothie algebra has additional null states. OK, so let's go back to the four, full fledged four dimensional physics. So let's take a, now a four point function of operators which have, where I'm leaving open these SG2 indices. And by, with no choice of generality for a four point function, I can put an operator at position Z, an operator at position 1, an operator at position 15, an operator on the plane of position Z and Z bar. 
So far, I haven't done anything. It's just a choice of conformal flame. How do I relate the full-fledged four-point function to my chiral algebra uh, four-point function? Well, I need to, com to contract these indices with a certain function of z bar, as I was doing in the previous examples. If I do this contraction, I, this non-trivial uh, correlator, which is a non-trivial function of z and z bar, becomes purely a meromorphic function. So, to summarize, the chiral algebra doesn't allow me to compute the full four-point function. It, it computes a certain meromorphic piece that I can obtain by contracting the full thing with a certain uh, tensor, which is a function of z bar. But the crucial observation is that this meromorphic piece is, in fact, sufficient to completely reconstruct the contribution to the full-fledged four-point function of the operator, which are in short representation of the super formal algebra. So this takes a bit of work, but it's nevertheless a fact that the entire contribution, the intermediate protected operator, the four-point function, is encoded in F. And then there are the non-protected operators, which are the blue things, which will drop out when I contract with these use. There's a technical target here. In order for the reconstruction to be unique, you have to assume that uh, the, there are no uh, conserved higher spin currents in the theory, but there is a conformal element of the Colin Mandula theory, which was proved by Baldassena and Giboedov, which says that um, if the theory has, has higher spin symmetry, it's free. So if the theory is not free, necessarily there are no higher spin currents, and then we can uniquely do this reconstruction. So the flow chart of our general program. We start with a theory of which we know the global symmetries and perhaps central charges. That is enough to com completely fix the chiral algebra. Because, for example, I know the global symmetry, I know I have enough fine cut smooth current, I know the level, I know everything. So I can compute this meromorphic piece. From the meromorphic piece, I can completely identify the short spectrum and, and the OP coefficients. And, and that already gives me this infinite amount of information with the short part. And finally, if I still have uh, some breath left, I can numerically constrain the long part using the methods of Rattazzi et al. Yes? I, I guess I have uh, sort of what is it? I, I haven't understood sort of conceptually what fixes the operator spectrum. You're saying that actually just the symmetries in the central charges is a unique and is a finite list of uh, in, operators? In, in, some, in a happy case. So sometimes this requires a little bit of guesswork. Uh, I, but um, At least there are isolated solutions, is what you would say. Or I would say it's easy to, to at least find a subset of the operator. So let me give an example. I know that the theory has a global symmetry, for example. Suppose that I, I'm interested in studying what, 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 what could an, a, a nice example be? I'm interested in studying uh, an exotic theory in four dimensions that, that, is, that is believed to exist, which has E6 uh, exceptional symmetry. Just from that information, <coughs> I know that my chiral algebra needs to contain any six affine Katsumudi algebra. And I also know the level, because, I, because uh, the level is one of, the, one of those robust information I can, I can compute for one normal dimension. Possibly the chiral algebra could contain more, but already this is a, subs this is a close subset of operators. Okay. I will show you in a minute a criterion that tells that in this particular case, very likely this is the complete, uh, this is a complete uh, thing, because I can further compute the uh, central charge and it matches with uh, with the Sugawara central charge. And so in this case, I have a compelling case of identified the full chiral algebra, and that tells you the entire uh, protected. Uh, con content of the theory, which will be, from the chiral algebra point, will be a, somewhat of a trivial. It will be arbitrary normal order products of the basic current. You know, it's a real, real, real but from the dimension of the point, it's a highly non-trivial state. 
So, but if I just want to study the four-point function of, of currents, of these six currents, of this theory, anyway, this is all the information I will ever need. The, the kind of operator that, that appear in the in the in the double V expansion of the six currents are determined by knowledge of these six current algebra. And, and what from what I said earlier, this is in fact enough to reconstruct all these opaque coefficients of 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 this of these normal order products. And so that's infinite amount of information I can feed into my to my boost of equation and then yes of course I'm left with the contribution of the of the non protected operator and with current knowledge I can only do that numerically. So, so the Vera Zoro symmetry is from A short upwards in that diagram? Just like a the, Zoro, the Vera Zoro symmetry acts on the chiral algebra of course. Right. And but will there be some way to trace this Vera Zoro symmetry into four dimensions and have it act on A long as well? No, it does not act on A long. So it can't even act or well it it can act, but it's, it's it, will not, it will not be a symmetry. But isn't it interesting to see how it acts? Uh, you, you could try. You could try. So from the four dimensional viewpoint, the Virazoro generators are, are essentially action of the of the arc current. You sort of know how it acts, but uh, it will not be a symmetry. In order for it to be a symmetry, it's necessary for me to be able to draw Q exact terms. Could you use it to be solution generating or something? I mean, often it's better if something's not really a symmetry. You could. You could try, yes. We could try. We haven't. We haven't thought about it. But one. Uh, so I'm guessing. I'm getting. Uh, well, actually, more or less, it's what been one hour. So uh, if, I, if you give me five more minutes, I can try to get to some punchline. Um, so why don't, we, why don't we do that, and then I think some of us might be interested in staying. But no. yeah. So maybe. Yeah. Yes, that's right. So let me let me give you one punchline as a, as the following. Um, even before you get, if numerics are not, I actually love kind of. Be, uh, became a level of numerics uh, very recently because of the, I think it gave us some real power. But even if you hate them and you want to stop here, <laughs> already um, you learned something uh, interesting because I can I told you I can compute exactly the OPE coefficients of, of the of the of a bunch of protected operators, and by imposing that these OPE coefficients are unitary, I learn new bounds on central charges. Let me give you the example here. In an any n equal to 2 super conformal field theory in, in four dimensions that has uh, any of the uh, simple uh, groups as a symmetry, there is a lower bound on the level of, uh, of the current, which is kind of interesting. And the next question you can ask, are these bounds saturated in any known theory? And yes, they are. They are saturated in a very interesting class of theories. These are the, 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 the theories which are obtained in F theory by a single D3 brain pro probing an F theory singularity. So some of them are, are GS Daniels theories. D4 is, is actually Lagrangian theories that deal with a C2 gauge group and four fundamental hypermultiplets, and then the, the theories we even have exotic. Uh, Global symmetries. And the claim to fame of this theory is that their Higgs branch uh, agrees with the moduli space uh, of instantons, of one instant moduli space for uh, SU2, SU3, D4, C7, and E8. And this is something which is mathematically, I think, very interesting. The fact that the bound is saturated means that something is some OP coefficient is going to zero. And so that means, algebraically, that my chiral algebra has to have a certain null state. What is the four-dimensional interpretation of the null state? Well, it's, this, it's the fact that the Higgs branch must have a certain relation. And th this is precisely the relation that, in, in the algebraic geometric description, the one interest moduli space as, as an algebraic variety, uh, was understood before. The fact that one is moduli spaces are certain algebraic varieties described by um, the minimum of the important orbit of the algebra and uh, these relations which are major observations are precisely one to one corresponding with the null states. So I think this is the tip of the iceberg, uh, iceberg of, a, of a much more general story where you relate representation theories of chiral algebras with algebraic geometry. 
find it mathematically a very nice story. Now, if you look at the single ch intermediate channel that the stress sensor can contribute, then you get a more intricate uh, bound that relates the C anomaly. Uh, this, these are dimension of the group and, and the dual constant number are just algebraic data, but you're, you're, you're getting a bound that relates uh, this, the C anomaly with the level. So this is a very interesting utility bound that you get from this kind of thing. In the A6 case, this bound will be saturated, which I think is compelling evidence that there's nothing else. You have completely cornered the uh, analogy. I, I think this might be a, a good place to stop, and uh, unless, uh, yeah, the story goes on. But um, let me give you a, a, a 30 seconds uh, summary of the rest. Now we can start playing this game systematically in uh, Lagrangian theories, uh, compute the chiral algebras there, using, use Dui to, to relate those chiral algebra to chiral algebra on, 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 of non-Lagrangian theories, and get a lot of mileage where um, many different games are, are, are possible. One game is uh, use physical intuition from the uh, dual that the theory should obey to derive interesting relations within chiral algebras. And, and then you, there are two things you can do. You can use uh, the duality to make a mathematical prediction about chiral algebra. You can check level by level, or vice versa, use uh, the power of chiral algebras to give evidence for the duality. And finally, uh, and this is a matter of another talk, you uh, proceed with the numerical boost of the non-protective part. That's it. <laughs> and finally, sorry, one, let me mention very quickly, I focus on four dimensions, but we can play the same game in, in six dimensions, and perhaps those of you who want to stay, I can, I can I really quickly explain the story. This is one of our most interesting results. From basically this completely abstract reasoning, we get to derive an exact formula for the three-point function of half BPS operator in the 2, 0 theory. This, this is from pure thought, essentially. Just algebraically, just from closure of the P, we derive this formula which agrees with the area safety calculation was done in the late 90s uh, for uh, 11 dimensional supergravity or in this side times s Okay, sorry for being a little over time. So I always have a question after hearing this kind of talk about how do we, you know, suppose one of these theories is right in some sense. Yeah, well, <laughs> they're all right. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, it's nature's choice. Okay. Uh, well, that's. Is, is there uh, any possibility that uh, you know, if we try to map to, to the world that we see? That well, the world that we see, the world that we see is certainly not exactly super symmetric. Yes, right. So perhaps not even approximately but yeah, certainly so not exactly super symmetric, so and certainly not exactly conformal. Right. You have to break supersymmetry, you have to, have to be back in the yeah. So, okay, the, the, before you even finish your question, the fair answer is that none of this is relevant for, directly relevant for, <laughs> for the real world. These are, for, these are conceptual exercises where we hope to learn about the structure of quantum theory itself, because we think that that will be valuable in of its 